going to mute while I cough. I've got a cough, by the way. Uh, you'll Oops. need to quarantine yourself. <laughs> I've got a cough. I've got a cough. <sighs> That's me having my cough. <clears throat> okay. Not too far away now, then, eh? I will give it. I'll give. We'll give. I just need time, okay. to, time to play the fancy intro music. Hmm? Have we got some of you? <laughs> I saw somebody was playing Simply the Best on Twitter, so I was going to like, no. Oh dear. <laughs> I don't know how it would work through my headset. So. I do have some fancy intro music, I just can't push it through uh, through Teams the way I've got my setup. Uh, is that because is that, is that Teams is not Zoom? No, it would be the same with Zoom as well. Uh, I've just, I've just. Just Craig and his, uh, his, his Zoom elitism. Yes. No, I mean, uh, the Teams is good, it's just, uh, I mean, it's... It's, it was around at RBS, but just nobody used it. It doesn't well, we're using it now. We're problem. using it now. We're all over it now. Saf's favourite. What's that? Oh, Sheer Saf's favourite. Come on, then. What are you going to put? I can't hear that, Donald. I got a phone call for a minute there. I'm happy with that, but I can't hear it. <laughs> really? Come on then. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna, we're gonna fall out, Mr. Henderson. We're gonna fall out. It's imminent. Could you could you please leave the call? <laughs> I'll send you the video later. <laughs> Did you not see the um the footage of uh, the folk singing Sunshine and Leaf down at the Banana Flats? Oh yeah, I heard about that. That was a few days ago. Ah, did you not see that, Donald? I did. I did. It was not uh, very good. I didn't think. <clears throat> harsh. I think it was a, just a nice idea. I guess they were just emulating what was going on in Italy, right? Aye, the idea was better than the reality, as often the way. I was going to say that's often the way, right? <laughs> to be brutally honest. Hmm? To be brutally honest. It's not like you, it's not like you. How many have we got on the call? 20, 19. 19. 23, 23. Oh, that's, that's uh, good. Right, I think I we should give it a few more minutes just because of the time mix-up and things. Uh, it's a time mix-up, but also because I sent it that mail about an hour ago just saying, by the way, it's 7 o'clock, so that'll have reminded anybody. Cool. Good. Well done, that man. <clears throat> we should all probably go and mute, but I guess Martin can control that from his end. Aye, so, yeah, he'll control mute and then I think he'll... Is this getting recorded? It yes, is, well, it is going out live on LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. There you go, eh? Whoosh. So I've started the live feed. Okay. So just Excellent. It's, it's, it's on its coming soon page. Nice. Well, I think we'll, I think we'll give it a few more yeah. minutes. Why, why not? Why well, I'll go up. You, are you going to host an intro then, Seth? Yes, I am. Yes. What's that you've shared? You not posted it in there, did you? Donald? Ah,
I've got about four hours worth of content. Is that okay, guys? <laughs> You've got... There you go, now we're on. You've always got loads of content. Loads and loads. Well, we could do we could do another one later in the year. Hopefully, uh, hopefully, a uh, uh, face to face at a nice venue with beer and pizza, you know. Yeah, I think all, you're you're all, ever hopeful be, there. All being well. What's that? I think you're ever hopeful there. I'm not sure we'll have any face to face this a, year. There's a there's a twenty twenty stuffed. There's, there's, all, there's always there's always there's always room for optimism. Yeah. I reckon. I actually I actually don't know if the stream can hear you as well. Probably not. You're probably just hearing like a, 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 mouth, a mouth moving and me a man making strange me. facial expressions. That'll be me. Me talking to myself, I think, is what everybody can hear. Right, fair enough. Well. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a, a an expressive face. <laughs> you, there's the chat as well. People saying everybody can hear okay. Oh, here comes Scott. Yes, we can hear both of you. Fab. Thank you for that. And see you if that's helpful. <laughs> Brilliant. Great. Right, very, that's good, okay. Right, a couple more minutes, shall we, gent? And I'll kick off. No worries. A mask off. Anything for attention. Mm. Is there any community announcements or anything else you want to announce at the minute as well? Yeah. I'm going to do them at the end. Right. Okay. I've got it all planned, Mr. Crow. Mr. Coburn, I've got it planned. <laughs> as, al as always, wait. Do you not? No, I'll do that at the end. All, all, the, all the post it notes are falling off my clip chart. The man with the plan. Mr. Trevor, right? How's it going? He, he thinks he's got a plan, but he hasn't done a web conference with me before. <laughs> no. I think that's, that's, in, that's in our not too distant future. Was it, uh, what was it Tyson said? Everyone's got a plan to get a punch in the mouth. <laughs> Fair enough. And on that note, I think I'll make a start. <laughs> Right, okay, I think we should start. Six minutes past, yeah, it's given everyone a chance to jump back on. Right, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us uh, at this uh, second event, Future Work in Scotland event of the year. Um, this one, obviously, we'd originally planned to, to do uh, at Napier, a venue we've used before, but in the circumstances, obviously, we've had to make it remote, but uh, no, thanks for being with us. Uh, this one has a little bit of added significance, actually, because it's um, we're doing it in collaboration with the BCS Agile Methods Group. Um, it's the first event that we've actually done as a methods group, because uh, Craig and I both um, are part of the, uh, the BCS Agile Methods Committee. And this is the first uh, BCS Agile Methods event we've done in Scotland. So added significance for, for some of us, so that, that's hard. And uh, I hope we'll do, uh, we'll do more over the year, over the rest of the year. And, um, time to come, hopefully some face-to-face -face ones later in the year, but so Martin thinks I'm being optimistic. Uh, as ever, we, we do have a, a code of conduct, and those of you who have attended some of our other events will be familiar with it, if you are all remote, but uh, we do have one, so please do familiarise yourself with it. It's available on the Hive. In short, we just ask that everybody be kind and respectful. 
one another. Um, and uh, we'll do uh, we'll do some community shout outs for some other fab events that are coming up over the coming weeks as we're all uh, confined to our homes. Um, Q and A. So just quickly, we will do a Q and A at the end once Martin's done his presentation. So I think we have a chat facility. Martin will keep me right here. So if you could start, you know, putting in any questions that come up as as Martin's doing his presentation, and Donald and I will kind of sift through them and uh, we'll um, relay them back to Martin so he can he can answer the questions that come up at the end. So hopefully that's a decent format for everyone. Uh, and with that, I think uh, just like to introduce our speaker. So, so Martin and I have known each other for quite a few years now. In fact, I uh, did Martin's uh, scrum or professional scrum training a few years ago now. In fact, I think it might have been one of the first ones in Scotland. So, so, so Martin does um, a lot of scrum or training and what consultancy, uh, agile and, and DevOps and. Uh, um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to his, 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 uh, his presentation tonight, um, hearing more about his personal experiences um, doing uh, agility in, in, in the enterprise. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll hand over to, to Martin. Martin, welcome. Hey folks, um, hopefully this is going to going to go well. Um, it's, it is kind of being recorded. It's uh, streaming uh, live on lots of different platforms. Um, I'm not sure how good the, the, the sound is or whether anybody could hear Sath, uh, that, that format, but uh, we're all here anyway, so it doesn't, doesn't matter. Um, I'm both a professional Scrum trainer, like Sath said, but also a Microsoft MVP as well in DevOps. And I kind of split that difference a little bit between uh, the technical skills uh, required to deliver deliver software at scale, as well as the, the the process ideas of you know keeping it simple, uh, like we all try and do. Um, so I created this presentation a little while ago. It's had various uh, names. Sling the dragons and how to successfully descale at scale is just the most recent one. I think it was unicorns last year, um, taming the unicorns. Uh, but the idea is the same. Um, that we really need to um, kind of talk about uh, uh, various things that are um, not just a problem at scale, but things that we know uh, uh, work pretty well um, that you can try. So nothing here I'm going to say is you must do it this way. Absolutely not. Uh, you need to figure out what works best within your organizational context. Um, and that can be um, that can be difficult depending on on what it is you're doing. So uh, let's start off. Um, if anybody wants to get in touch with me later, please do any way you like. Um, I'm pretty much uh, everywhere. I'm in uh, Glasgow. Uh, that's where I'm based, and that's where I am currently confined, like everybody else. Um, so if you do do need something, I'm here and in the in the time zone. Um, I did see there's a few uh, folks I know from um, other countries logged on. Um, I saw Anna and Oganjin uh, were logged on, so um, there's a few few people from further afield European time zones. Uh, the thing that's behind um, what what I'm talking about is that that idea. You've probably seen this before. Uh, firms today experience a much higher uh, velocity of business change. Business is changing a lot more quickly and, and we need to, to keep up. Um, and it's not just about process, it's a balance between process and engineering. Um, without good engineering skills, we might build a lot of the right thing, but it will not be very good um, or not meet the need. And without the process skills, we'll maybe not build the thing we're supposed to build. Uh, so I, I've got a, a little uh, story first um, that I've used a couple of times before. I, I, I find it quite, well, it's kind of amusing, kind of not, um, but it's the story of how a, a company with nearly $400 million in the bank uh, went bankrupt in about 45 minutes because of a failed deployment. Uh, some of you might've heard this story. It's from the Knight Capital Group um, in, in the US. 
Um, there are Fortune 500, uh, or not Fortune 500, what's it called? A, a, a New York Stock Exchange uh, company. Um, and they had a new feature they were deploying to production. It was some kind of new order handling uh, feature that changed the way uh, that worked. Um, and while they were um, replacing old, old stuff with new, they had kind of um, a, a big legacy. Um, you, you know what it's like in, 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 in your teams today. There's usually anything that's been around for a while, there's a lot of technical debt in the system, a lot of spaghetti code that ends up sitting around for ages unless your teams continuously refactor and focus on engineering excellence. Um, so this idea is they had uh, kind of nine-year-old unused code and they decided to repurpose a flag in the system. You know, there's this flag sitting there. It's not doing much. Uh, let's just use that uh, in order to turn this new code on. Um, and when they did a deployment, they were doing manual deployments. Um, and the technician only deployed to seven of the eight servers. So you can imagine when, as soon as they turned the flag on, uh, something weird started happening, and it actually uh, took uh, it took it took the whole system down. Um, it wasn't operating correctly, so they weren't getting the the orders through uh, they they were expecting. And because the system was down, um, they were losing about a uh, hundred and seventy thousand dollars per minute. Um, and as you can imagine, uh, that set off a lot of alarm bells, and they go to try and uh, fix it, uh, but when they try and fix it, they, they they can't figure out what the problem is because it's the amount of code they deployed is too much. Uh, the flag had unintended consequences, and uh, the the deployment to seven of eight the eight servers, even the technician that did the work didn't really understand that that's what they'd done. So there was no visibility or transparency into that because it was a manual deployment, a step or a couple of steps or something was skipped uh, and not noticed. Um, and they ended the day uh, $460 million down and had to file for uh, uh, bankruptcy. And I think the important question there is what would be <coughs> the impact in your organization uh, of a critical system that folks write code for or that's deployed uh, being being down for, for a day, for two days. Um, some big examples recently were uh, some airlines. There was British Airways went down. Uh, American Airlines uh, went down for three days uh, because of a mainframe fault. Uh, that You can't get any more technical debt uh, than mainframe sitting there. Um, in this particular case, because it was a public uh, company, because uh, it's on the stock exchange, they have to do um, an SEC filing for um, bankruptcy, um, and you know that's how we know so much about it. You can go and look up this filing and see exactly uh, what the what the problems were. And 2013 is not really that long ago. Um, they really should have known better. And even around the, in fact, later than the 2013 timeframe, I, I worked with an organization in the Netherlands around uh, 2014, 2015. And they were uh, an international bank, and their real-time banking transaction system, um, the servers, five servers around the world that govern this, were, were their, their code was not under source control. Um, the team that organized it believed that source control would slow them down. Um, so in order to, to make changes to this real-time banking transaction system, uh, for an international bank, they would log on uh, to one of the servers, uh, open up their IDE, make changes to the code, and compile it on the production server. Um, I did ask, how do you share that code across all five servers? And the response was, that's why there's five of us. So each of the servers are owned by one of the engineers. The engineer goes on to uh, that that individual server, that's their server, and they write and maintain the code on that server. So they've got five servers all doing the same thing that all have different code and different setup. Um, and for me, that was a huge business risk. Uh, but for the business, the bigger risk, or at least for management of that group, the bigger risk was that this team was the only team that understood what to do, so they get to write the rules. Uh, and that can often be the case, little fiefdoms cropping up as well.
Uh, so how do we not have this happen? Um, we need to get you need to get better at it. You need to practice, do it often, do it all the time. Uh, that's kind of the moral of that story. Automate everything. You shouldn't have any manual practices uh, uh, in your in your process. Your your delivery from developer committing code all the way through to being in production should be totally automated. Uh, you might have approvals along the way, uh, but the approvals should be you know clicking a button, ticking a box, uh, not actually following any technical steps. So can you can you think of any other uh, really big crazy failures, uh, uh, like multi-billion dollar failures, because I can think of two. Uh, the first one uh, was a failure of quality. Um, so this was a, a massive product that instead of taking three years to deliver to production, ended up taking six and they cut 80% of the features they were trying to deliver. And their problem was technical debt, and that was Windows Vista. Um, anybody that used it when it first came out will have felt some of that pain. Um, so that was a quality issue, um, and Microsoft worked very hard to, to build up an engineering excellence after that. Uh, but the problem was that they still didn't, um, they still weren't building the right thing. So they ended up with a mismatch to customer desires, which was indeed Windows 8, um, which was a massive uh, uh, mismatch uh, to that idea. So it was after Windows 8 um, that they started focusing both on the engineering excellence and on the um, getting the right features into production, which means you have to get tighter feedback loops, which is where Windows 10 was born. And Windows 10, sh effectively, from our perspective, Windows 10 ships to production every 30 days. Uh, but from the team that, that writes on it, 4,500 engineers, um, they ship to production daily. Um, the code that an engineer writes today is running on the CEO's laptop tomorrow. Everybody inside of Microsoft uh, gets the internal build. Um, they can choose to install their own machine and then not get the build. In case anybody's on here that, that's Microsoft and knows, uh, there, is a, there is an escape hatch if you don't like that. Uh, but for, for, for the majority of people, they're, they're taking that at faster build. And for those of you in the know, a machine I'm on just now is in the Windows 10 Insider preview, so I get weekly dev builds um, from the Windows from the dev branch of the Windows team. Um, that that is uh, there's about 17 million people uh, that do that, so it's a, a lot of people kicking the tires. And I think that's the important thing: is uh, 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 getting stuff into production as quickly as possible. Um, so. I think this idea of uh, learning is something that you're all familiar with. Um, and I, I want to just uh, uh, posit some kind of problems and challenges that I think um, many people seem to, to have had. Um, I, I particularly like this one because you, you do a product release and then you either get a smiley face back or some strange characters uh, back. Usually, um, well, th this being Scotland, it would just be swear words, um, but in most of the world, um, it'd probably just be swear words anyway. Um, what is this pile of uh, uh, crap that you've... Uh, why should I uh, care? Um, so the, the three things that I think pose this problem um, for, for agility is, is what, how, and who. Um, and if we break that down a little bit, uh, the what challenges. Some of you will be familiar uh, with this uh, data. It's from the, the Standish group um, in Boston that do the chaos report. Um, so no focus on, on product strategy and ineffective prioritization. Um, I believe very few organizations that say they're doing Agile actually have a prioritized backlog. Um, so if you don't have a prioritized backlog, the engineers are just going to make up whatever it is that they, that they want to do uh, to work on it. Um, so 65% of the functionality that we build is not used by our customers. That's average. You could be worse or better. Uh, most people that think they're better usually end up being worse when they look at the data. 35% um, of your requirements were change. I'm sure you're familiar with that figure as well. Um, but weak product owners, uh, poorly defined responsibilities and product management are key uh, parts of that what challenge. Um, so. They focus, instead of focusing on um, a product and making the right decisions for a product, 
uh, they focus on time limited short term uh, uh, goals uh, called projects and those projects uh, may or may not provide benefit to the overall product as the person running the project is not measured generally by the overall success of the product the measured by the short term uh, success of the project um, and in those worlds you tend to have a, a long time to market kind of long cycle times I, I would personally say anything longer than 30 days uh, time to market is too long. Um, there's a, another organization uh, that agrees with me. I did a presentation recently um, on detecting agile bullshit, uh, which is a Department of Defense article. Uh, you, I think that did that uh, last, last week. Uh, so you can go uh, find that as well, uh, where I talk about some of those issues. I've got a slide from it further on in the presentation for you guys. Um, the who challenges, who's doing the work, um, apparently this is where we lose a lot. Uh, we lose 50% for ineffective collaboration. Uh, now I know many of you work with teams that are trying their best to be effective collaborators. Um, you're probably, your number is probably better than 50%. An average across um, all, uh, something like 70,000 IT projects. Uh, worldwide, uh, but that idea um, you might you might be not far off that fifty percent, depending on the way your organization is is managed. Um, ineffective servant leadership that 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 idea of people being managers instead of leaders inside the organization is kind of key there, and it's a a, a big uh, struggle. And not having good objectives, you know that that misalignment of um, uh, where we're going with people's understanding of what it is, is, is fairly, fairly common. Um, and then we end up with these hierarchies of, uh, organizational structure that are based on, uh, 130 year old Tayloristic practices, um, that are really outmoded for the modern, modern workplace. Um, so that was the who, there is also the how in the how, um, we, we're really seeing um, that that growth of technical debt, um, it, it's it's systemic in our in our industry, and it, even big companies like like Microsoft, um, who whose job it is to build software, um, end up with significant amounts of technical debt. Uh, I like to use uh, data. I'm not sure if I have that uh, data in here. I can get it for anybody who asks for it. Um, but I have data around um, how many features uh, the Azure DevOps team in Microsoft was shipping to production eight years ago when they were still a waterfall team um, and how many features they're shipping to production now. Uh, when they were a waterfall team mounting technical debt, only deploying once every two years, uh, they were shipping about 25 features to production each year. That's with 650 people. Um, and with the same number of people now having spent eight years paying back their technical debt. So moving that needle from fighting the technical debt, struggling with complexity towards adding new features, uh, they now add um, more than 270 features to production each year. Um, so that just shows if they were spending 90% of their time struggling with complexity, pay back that technical debt and you get a lot more done because uh, your teams aren't struggling with that so much. Um, that's a that's a common uh, growth of technical debt is one of the, the biggest uh, um, blockers to that. Uh, so you really need to focus on that from an engineering perspective. But also I mentioned anything that's automated, uh, sorry, anything that's manual, you want to automate everything. Uh, so manual testing, uh, manual environment provisioning, manual build and integration, manual deployment, manual anything is a problem. Um, I did work with a team in uh, Athens that um, was using a, a product called Star Team to do their source control. Uh, don't get me started. We moved them off Star Team, but um, one of the features of Star Team is branching and merging, as you would expect from a source control system. Uh, but the team didn't know. They knew about branching, but they didn't know about merging. So there was uh, 30, 30, uh, between 30 and 60 people in this organization that when they wanted to bring changes from a branch across to the main line, they were manually copying and pasting those changes across. There are still teams out there who don't understand some of these fundamental concepts. Um, 
need to start uh, 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 focusing on anything that's manual is a bad idea. Um, if we take all of that that data that we saw there for the different um, different challenges, uh, the thing I like is this little uh, graph here. If your input uh, was a hundred euros, uh, what would your output be? Um, based on 35% of your time spent building the right features. So then we've only got 35% left. So out of 100, that's 35 euros. Um, if we lose 50% for collaboration, uh, we're down to 17 and a half uh, euros out of 100. Um, and if we spend 30% of our time building new features and 70% of our time struggling with complexity, uh, we end up spending five uh, euros 25 on adding new features um, out of a hundred. That, that's, that's a horrendous uh, ROI, um, but it's the reality for many organizations out there. Um, that, just to put that in perspective, uh, for a million pounds, um, spend a million pounds on a project, that's 52,500 pounds of value. Um, that's, that's just not not good enough. Um, and that's not just engineering, that's business processes, uh, that's uh, no focus on uh, collaboration. Uh, these are these are super, super common industry-wide. Uh, I know some of your teams might be better than that, but you also work inside of wider organizations that may still have some of those problems. Uh, so we want to um, be collaborative to be more effective. Um, that's why, you know, that's why this little uh, document exists. The idea of the Agile Manifesto was to, to um, try and focus on the right things rather than the wrong things that organizations have been focusing on, um, but it's still uh, taking, taking time to get there. And one of the things that I see, uh, I, I know um, this is a, a, the way we do things around here is the common thing. Was it the cu culture eats agility for breakfast or culture eats change for breakfast or culture just eats everything for breakfast? Um, that's part of that, that uh, problem. Um, so does this journey that organizations undertake, uh, companies talk about an agile transformation. I, I don't really like that phrase because transformation implies some kind of completion uh, which I think is just fundamentally not uh, not true. Um, I usually think about it more as an agile evolution. Um, as, a, as an organization, you're going to be con constantly changing uh, towards an effectively an unknown goal um, that uh, you can have an idea of where you would like to go next, where would you like to go in the next few steps, um, but ultimately where you end up is going to be somewhere uh, different. Um, I usually use uh, uh, this kind of diagram. Um, I know the Schneider model is uh, not, I'm not selling you on the Schneider model for sure. Um, it's just for illustrative purposes uh, that if we ha uh, break our organization up into, into these kind of sectors, where would you plot your company? Would your company be in the more uh, controlling space or in cultivating uh, uh, people's space? Is it based on competence or collaboration? Um, what what percentage of each of these would it be uh, based on? There's no no hundred percent anything, but if your organization uh, was in a particular place and you say you want to go somewhere else, it's not actually a straight path like that. It's more of a wibbly wobbly uh, road. Um, I like to think of it as orienteering. Um, you, you, you go off in a particular direction, uh, you hit an obstacle, uh, you figure out how to get around it, and then you figure out what's, how do we reorientate back to um, that, that important direction that we're trying to get to and see where we get to. So it might not quite be the same place you thought you were going to get to. Hopefully it would be uh, 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 a better, a better place. Um, so one of the things that I think is re really important is you, you can't, I think I've said a lot of important things. Um, every organization is, is, is unique. You start from a unique spot, even if 
you use you use Snyder, you start from a unique spot, you end up in a unique spot. Um, however you want to plot that. Um, everybody is unique. So the idea that you can take a methodology that somebody else has built and apply it to your organization is really a fallacy. It's, a, it's, it's, it's not going to work. What works for you might not work for another organization. For What works for them might not work for somebody else. Um, and experimentation and iterating towards uh, uh, th these ideas is really important. But that iteration towards ideas, that acceptance that our current processes are imperfectly defined, is fundamentally, it fundamentally means that we can't just use somebody else's process. I have two processes that I'm thinking of. <laughs> I'm sure you're familiar with both of these. Um, one is uh, SAFE, the Scaled Agile Framework. Um, I know the newer versions of SAFE, I think my picture is V4 of SAFE. Um, I can't remember what they're on now. They might be as high as V6. But the ideas, uh, 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 original idea of SAFE was uh, Dean, Dean Leafingwell implemented uh, in an organization how to do everything and then documented it and published it as a framework that, that folks could uh, folks could use um, and it quite often failed in in fact mostly it failed in organizations that it was implemented afterwards it might have worked in the first organization because that was custom built for them but then failed in future organizations same with the spotify model um, the Spotify model is not really a Spotify model. I mean, the, 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 the folks at Spotify uh, would kind of laugh if you said you implemented uh, the Spotify model uh, because what is written in that white paper is not what those teams do today. Um, the white paper and the presentations that the Spotify team did were a point in time presentation, a point in time uh, uh, understanding of what... Um, uh, what they were doing at that point in time. They've moved on since then. They've changed their practices to suit what worked and what didn't. Some of the practices that are described in that white paper lasted a couple of months. Some of them lasted a couple of years. Some of them lasted five minutes. It just depends uh, um, uh, what, what things uh, make sense. And I think that's the important thing. Because uh, really, uh, this is something I like to say, uh, there's no such thing as best practices, only adequate practices for the situation at hand. Um, there's, there's, there's no guarantees. Um, everything's going to be different. Uh, and I really enjoyed, uh, I don't know if anybody saw, uh, or if anybody's read um, the, the Department of Defense, uh, How to Detect Agile BS, um, but it's an article that was uh, written, uh, a white paper sent out to all of the procurement officers uh, within the Department of Defense to help them figure out whether their uh, vendors are actually telling them the truth about being agile or they're just saying they're agile because, you know, that's the thing you have to say now in order to get the contract. Um, and something happened uh, recently. Uh, those, that, those that know um, might have um, seen this already. Uh, but I have a little uh, U.S. Air Force. Um, I have the original memorandum uh, that came with this. This was a clarification uh, of that that memo. Um, and the 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 CSO, uh, the the I can't remember what CSO stands for. Chief something officer. Well, I can't remember. Anyway, um, the 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 senior officer in charge of IT. Um, for the U.S. Air Force, is quite a progressive thinker, um, and he likens SAFE to Waterfall. It's a large, bloated, prescriptive framework that tells you how to go do something, um, and you won't find any large, successful commercial organizations doing anything that looks like SAFE. They've all built their own custom process based on the way they do things. Now, I'm not saying that SAFE doesn't have value. I think it does have value in certain circumstances. Um, if you see the the like the 
fifth bullet point down, safe might be potentially might potentially be use a useful framework for teams who do not use DevOps. Uh, but a key principle of DevOps is to decouple work in teams and only synchronization required should be across product owners, blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's not quite right, but you know what I mean? Um, that idea of having that, that monolithic process, I don't think really, uh, really works. Um, that said, uh, lots of organizations that are not yet ready for DevOps, not yet ready for true agility, um, get a little way of the way there. Uh, but I think there's definitely a, what's it called when you, you think you're, you're there, but you're not there. There's a false sense of security, maybe. Mm. I'm not sure what the word is, um, but the, you have this false sense uh, that you're, you're, you're doing something agile when you're using SAFE, uh, when SAFE is in fact the complete antagonistic opposite of, of agility. It's a prescriptive framework. Um, and I know that new versions of SAFE are less prescriptive, but that's its source, that's its roots, um, and you may as well be doing uh, PMI, Prince2 versions of Agility, um, provide the same benefit. Uh, I think start from something that, that works a little bit, little bit better. Uh, so hopefully everybody's read the, this idea of five dysfunctions uh, of a team. Um, it's an awesome, awesome book. Um, and I have the presentation on detecting Agile BS that goes into a little bit of that. Uh, but the thing that we tend to do um, in organizations is we 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 have this complex world um i think however however you 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 understand it i think this is uh, uh, the idea of software development being product development rather than product delivery you know a, a, a car production line is product delivery uh, toyota developed uh, the, the lean Toyota production system in order to deliver cars, not design cars. The design team for Toyota don't use uh, the lean Toyota production system because it's a different sort of work. In the software world, which I am, that's my background, our production line is our DevOps pipeline. That's our, from the time a developer commits code to the repository till it gets into production, and um, that's our production line. For everything before that, uh, the writing of the code, the merging everything together, those are those are creative endeavors that sit in this uh, complex world of more is unpredictable than predictable with emerging answers and many competing ideas. I'm sure you've, you've seen these before. I know um, I've talked to Sathpal about these uh, quite often. Uh, but organizations tend to use uh, a, a different management style. The, the leader's job uh, uh, they tend to use is best practice. You know, I hear that all the time in organizations, this idea of best practices uh, and uh, establishing patterns and optimizing to them. Uh, and you wouldn't believe the number of organizations that still have a, a command and control uh, hierarchical outlook to the world. It, it's it's uh, very difficult um, to get, to get um, organizations to treat complex work like complex work. Um, so in a, in a complex environment, you're supposed to create a bounded environment for action. So we want to have some boundaries so everybody's going in the same direction. But inside of those boundaries, we don't really know how to solve the problem. Um, so we need folks to kind of get there uh, uh, themselves. And obviously, we want to increase communication because with talking to each other more, we come up with better ideas. Um, so generating those ideas, servant leadership, obviously, to get things out of the way for those people to be able to do the work and do it effectively, create an environment for that to work. Um, so we need to start somewhere. Um, and where we need to start um, is probably uh, some kind of loose framework. Um, my background is, is Scrum. I'm not opposed to replacing every time I mention the word Scrum with Kanban. Uh, I'm just using this for illustrative purposes again. Um, I like Scrum. I like Scrum with Kanban. I teach the professional Scrum with Kanban uh, class from scrum.org. I'm co-teaching with Daniel Vacanti. Uh, we're going to do an online class for, well, it was supposed to be an in-person class in Edinburgh, uh, but obviously it's going to be uh, uh, virtual. Uh, but I'm going to be teaching with Daniel Vacanti in a couple of months. And we're going to dive into how do we take those um, uh, complementary Kanban ideas, the core practices of Kanban, and apply them into the, the Scrum world. 
Um, so I don't think I mentioned that in this uh, presentation, but um, it's, 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 it's pretty good. Um, you can go and get the, ca the, the Kanban guide for Scrum teams, which is a free uh, um, on under our website. Uh, so we have this idea of potentially using some kind of framework. I'm using the Scrum framework uh, for a product inside an organization. So we maybe have one team working against this product. Um, and instead of being part of the hierarchy, they kind of exist within a, a separate bubble. I've seen this done uh, in um, uh, organizations where they've actually created a separate company for the engineering teams to work in so they can work in a different way out with the hierarchy of the rest of the organization. Um, I've seen this done in uh, KLM where they created uh, a studio uh, for that work to happen and move the software and software teams into that and it used services from the rest of the organization. So those shared services might be uh, infrastructure, QA, might be um, HR, might be any of those or those things outside of that. Um, so you basically get a small pocket of Scrum inside your organization. A lot of organizations try to do a massive transformation. They maybe do a small pilot project, then a massive transformation, um, and generally those fail. Uh, usually they end up at something using something like safe because they need to figure out how to do everything all at once and that just tells you that. So this uh, Scrum framework is just a tool. I mean the, the Scrum is just a tool to help us create an empirical process control system within which we can inspect and adapt towards uh, creating a more optimal system. Uh, that's really what it's designed for. Same, same as Kanban except a little bit more meta but it makes sense. So do Scrum well or do Kanban well is your first step. Um, and by do it well, uh, I mean that people are, are really not good at even doing Scrum at all um, or doing Kanban at all. Um, I talk to teams all the time who say they're doing Kanban and then, you know, they've just got a board with stickies that move across it. Kind of like, that's not Kanban. Where are your whip limits? Where are your... Uh, your concrete processes where are they've not decided any of those things so some interesting data here which is actually from Forrester research um, is only 22 percent of organizations that say they've adopted agile um, are actually doing short iterations well if you're not doing short iterations you're not very agile only 13 percent do retrospectives if you're not inspecting and adapting what, what, what are you doing? And only 16% of prioritized backlogs. Th these are appalling numbers um, that are, that are uh, only, only getting, getting worse as more organizations move towards agility and more snake oil salesmen and charlatans convince them to do the wrong thing. Um, I actually work with some, some folks in organizations um, that their organization is sold on safe so they create something that they can sell as safe, but it's actually much more agile than safe. It's a custom process for them. Um, so some organizations that say they're doing safe actually aren't doing safe at all. They're doing their own thing and that's okay. I'm okay with that. Uh, so just some extra data. If we fix these problems, uh, we can improve a lot of things in our organization um, and try not have just skin deep. I, I like that expression, skin deep agile. I think Ken and Jeff call it flaccid agile. Um, I like that one as well. I usually call it um, mechanical. I call it mechanical scrum. We're just mechanically following it. We're not actually doing the things. Um, and those uh, uh, are, are pretty, pretty effective. Uh, so step two is you need to enhance it. You need to do those things uh, like create empirical systems, uh, have our engineering practices, coding guidelines, uh, user experience, emergent architecture, all of those things. And, and once we've got good engineering practices, for me, that's the engineering practices part. So you've got mechanical scrum, engineering practices, and then introduce the values behind the processes. How do you build uh, a system within which you can have transparency, uh, that you see the truth? Uh, and these are trying to, trying to create that. Um, so whatever you're you're doing, you need to focus on all of those things uh, to get 
to this idea of doing something professionally rather than just doing something. Um, and I think that's that's the fault of, in many organizations is they don't focus on professional scrum because we don't have time to do testing, let's just get stuff done. Or we don't have time, whatever the things we don't have time for. So focus on that professionalism. And then we end up with, with some kind of small, loose framework um, around which we can build our own custom processes. Uh, that's the idea I'm looking at. So we can then add multiple teams into this bubble um, that all work by different rules, use these shared services, um, and we've upskilled the individual teams. Because the reality is that uh, skilled teams are 224% more likely to be successful than unskilled teams. That seems like it makes common sense, but it doesn't necessarily make common sense in a lot of organizations. Uh, they believe that Scrum or Kanban is just this uh, uh, unicorn that's able to solve all of their problems, um, but it ends up being, as uh, you've heard the term Scrummer fall or mini waterfalls, um, and everything ends up being a bit of a car crash. Um, that's a, a very uh, common uh, thing. I actually do have the, the, the Kanban stuff in here, never mind. Um, so one thing that I always get teams to do once they get to that professional scrum level is they need to start looking at their flow um, and optimizing for it. Uh, folks on the call who are agile practitioners who work uh, in these big organizations, uh, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you take a bunch of amateur teams and try and get them to look at their flow, it's an even bigger car crash. You have to get professional teams first, uh, get them follow, all going in the same direction, uh, delivering a working increment every iteration. Once you can get there, start introducing flow, start optimizing for smaller batches um, and, and focus on uh, that idea. And I mentioned the professional uh, 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 Scrum with Kanban, the Kanban Guide for Scrum Teams. Um, it talks about the five core uh, practices. Visualize, limiting work in progress, actively manage items, make policies explicit, and improve collaboratively. Um, those are the core practices from Kanban, so I'm not talking about the Kanban method, uh, which is from LKU. I'm just talking about those, those core uh, Kanban practices. And something that uh, Ken said uh, recently, uh, was that the only foundation to scale is professional teams. You need to get to professional teams first before you can scale. Um, I'm sure you've seen a bunch of unprofessional teams shoved together and tried to build some software. It's always an amusing car crash. Um, but Steve Porter, uh, who was one of the co-creators of the Kanban guide for Scrum Teams, added that manage flow. The only foundation for scale is professional teams that manage flow. Because the reality is, oh, scaling is expensive, it's hard, it's wasteful. Ultimately, don't scale. Scaling is an anti-pattern of software development. You need to avoid it at all costs. Because um, scaling doesn't go linearly. It, it, it has this uh, very quick uh, tail off as you add more people. Um, and then at some point you add enough people that it gets too complicated and you end up with something uh, that is just not a lot of fun. Um, this is, this. I, I, I think this is a, a PI planning. Yeah, this is the last PI, this is the video from the last PI planning that I saw. Um, so you can scale continuously as long as you do certain things, um, but you need to do them all the time. Uh, you need to identify and remove impediments. Uh, uh, sorry, dependencies. Dependencies are going to be your killer. Um, so anytime you can create uh, vertical slices, so feature teams rather than horizontal teams, obviously, um, but integrating work all the time across all levels. One of the downfalls of Office uh, 2012 was that they weren't integrating every uh, iteration. They had most of their stuff integrated, but not everything. So then they ended up nine months later with a big problem. Um, and then create uh, and inspect those increments regularly, obviously. Uh, make sure your teams have the tools and skills necessary uh, to do things at scale. Um, it's going to take more tools. It's going to take uh, more time. It's going to be harder uh, to do. 
need to get get up, get on board with that, and obviously keep keep inspecting and adapting frequency frequently. Um, Scrum.org uh, noticed that this scaling thing was a problem. They were very uh, late to the scaling uh, framework party, and the reason for that was they wanted to take their time and make sure that they had something that in keeping with Scrum is the absolute minimum you need to make sure you maintain the levels of communication that you need to create an empirical process control system. Uh, so they came up with something called the, the Nexus framework, uh, which is a lot smaller than a lot of the other frameworks that are out there. Um, I'm thinking of uh, uh, Scrum at scale, I'm thinking of SAFE, I'm thinking of other frameworks, because it's not going to tell you how to go solve your problems. It's just going to uh, um, deal with those communication issues between uh, teams. Um, I've seen Nexus I've seen Nexus implemented quite a few times with organizations, um, and it's very easy and quick for people to understand because it's only a little bit more than Scrum, um, and it it doesn't um, add a huge amount of of complexity or overhead. Uh, you've effectively got this idea of um, you know, you, you're going to have to do refinement now. Whereas if you've got one scrum team with three people, you maybe don't have to refine. But if you've got nine scrum teams of 10 people working together, man, you're going to have to uh, uh, make sure you have all of your uh, 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 backlogs uh, in a good state. And then you need little teams of teams to get together to make sure that you have good communication. So you can see the Nexus sprint planning has a little Nexus that gets together, it's a team of teams, it's the right people, open, source, open space rules um, from the scrum teams that get together to figure out some dependencies, figure out how we're going to move forward for the next sprint um, and then take it back to the rest of the scrum teams, which may or may not be in the same time zone. It's okay to have multiple, as long as the individual members of your team are on the same team, on, in the same time zone, in the same, uh, uh, co-located, they don't have to be co-located, but it's more optimal, then uh, more optimal is having those teams together and then multiple teams in multiple locations around the world can work together. So a, 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 a Nexus sprint planning might run over 24 hours because you've got that time lag. We just need to deal with that problem. We need to figure out how to do that. Obviously, the closer people are, the better, but those are the realities of business. Um, and then we need a view on all of our work, so the Nexus Sprint Backlog, uh, with a way to view individual teams' backlogs. We only have one review because we've got one product. I think that's important. Uh, but even on a daily basis, we maybe have that team of teams get together to discuss dependencies and issues, and then at the, at the, at the whole Nexus level, and then take that back to the team's daily scrums. Again, just a 15 minute before everybody else's daily scrum, representatives that make sense from the other teams get together figure it out take that information back same in the retrospective you're going to have uh, but you're going to have kind of you're going to have two one at the beginning one at the end because uh, you might have a bunch of things that need to be input into the team's retrospectives and then the teams might come up with all sorts of clever ideas to go solve those things so that team of teams gets together to bring all that information back that's the idea from nexus it's just meant to be the minimum I'm not saying it's the right framework for you, um, but it can be a useful, uh, a useful tool that has those very simple added extras uh, to help you get that, that increment at the end. Um, I didn't mention the Nexus integration team uh, because it tends to be uh, very poorly understood. Uh, the integration team is not uh, uh, your DevOps team. It's not your build team. It's a team of teams. It's a group of people who get together to solve whatever problem is inhibiting the team's ability to get a working increment. There's no point in the scrum masters getting together if the problem is merging code. They're not going to know how to solve that problem. Uh, you need the right people. So effectively, uh, a Nexus integration team is just uh, representatives from various teams, the right people. Maybe they're scrum masters, maybe they're engineers. Uh, it just depends on what the problem is they're trying to solve. It's not a permanent team. They're going to go back and the teams, the individual scrum teams inside the Nexus do the do the work. That's the idea behind uh, Nexus and having these uh, 
cooperation teams. So then we can bring in a much larger uh, uh, product into our story. Um, you've got lots of little small products using those ser shared services, and then we bring in a, a larger product into that into that world. Uh, so that's more than three uh, teams working together. I don't know where that animation came from, but never mind. So that, that essence of scaling is we need to um, anticipate problems by uh, uh, focusing on minimizing dependencies. That's your, your, your almost uh, most expensive concern is minimize dependencies. Um, and then make working software. You're still a team of people working together to make a single product. So if you don't have a working increment at the end of every iteration, we're, 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 we're not there yet. We need to get that working integration. So just inspecting and adapting towards uh, that world. And you're probably talking about more engineering practices. Fo absolute focus on minimizing technical debt, uh, automated testing, continuous build and delivery. Very, very, very important. Um, some examples of uh, uh, teams that are using um, Nexus. Uh, Capital One uh, has delivered some products uh, with Nexus. Um, and I, I like the comment there, it took less than an hour to explain Nexus to teams that are already familiar with Scrum. It's not much more than Scrum. Uh, so Capital One, um, Cathay Pacific Airlines um, also use Nexus as well. And uh, uh, that, that really helps. Uh, so while um, I think it, this is a very, mis uh, well, I think this is a misleading uh, quote, uh, but small teams of 32% more likely to succeed, large projects are 600%. Um, that's because large projects are such a big mess uh, that they can get 600% improvement. Um, they probably both uh, uh, get a, a similar improvement. It's just much more obvious in a large project. And I think small project here is 50 people or less. Large project is more than 50 people. The else reports definitely what, uh, what that is. Um, so we, we came up with this um, kind of bubble, just back to my bubble of uh, uh, scr Scrum in my case, or bubble of Kanban, or even you could have one team doing Kanban, another one doing Scrum, it doesn't matter. But you've got these shared services, this bubble in which uh, people work differently um, and potentially you need to at some point you're going to have enough going on in there that you need to start focusing on the uh, leadership ideas um, and that's where you start to look at how do we get the C CEO, CIO involved in that and provide agile functions of leadership like HR, finance and admin uh, that are things that the whole team uh, uh, can use in an agile fashion rather than just using the shared services from other projects. Um, how do you build this new type of organization that is a flatter structure, not based on hierarchy um, inside of that? Um, and then this idea of bringing in more uh, products. You might have some bigger uh, products that have multiple Nexus. Uh, again, the Windows team has four and a half thousand people working on it. Uh, and the Office, I think, has 300 Scrum teams. 300 scrum teams now they've come up with their own way to solve that problem that's okay too this is just a framework uh, that you could use to help you get started uh, but um, it, it's it's interesting to note that the characteristics uh, that I'm showing here are things that these big organizations that are doing agile well whatever they call those things or how they implement them they have something uh, that, that kind of fits uh, this bill um, and the next thing we need to understand is how, how do we know it's all working? Uh, so something that I think is very important is understanding whether you're making improvements to the organization. Organizations spend a lot of money with us agile practitioners uh, to come in and help them get better at delivering software. How do we know we're making things better? Well, we need some kind of metrics to monitor. Um, Scrum.org uh, uh, has some example metrics and I'm really stressing that super uh, heavily example metrics in particular categories. Uh, but I think the categories are the thing that's important. Uh, we've got to look forward to, towards the future with market value. Uh, so you've got the current value you've delivered in your product and how you monitor and measure that. So you're going to need some metrics around current value. How do we understand that? 
and then we've got unrealized value value we don't know that we need to have yet how do you look at the market how do you look at market trends and analysis and figure that out fold that into ability to innovate how quickly uh, 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 can we uh, innovate how much time will we spend innovating in our product uh, so we need some metrics around around our innovation so that might be capex versus opex is a super simple one but i think it gets cloudy uh, you're going to need some other measures in there and then time to market how quickly can we actually get our product in front of users and i'll use the example of the windows team again which gets their software every 30 days in front of 600 well i think it's is it not a, a billion machines now yeah it was, used to be 600 million machines it's closer to a billion machines now uh, worldwide that's pretty impressive engineering practices uh, to get there i don't know why that animation's coming in i have some example measures in the deck i'm not going to go through them all um, i'll just uh, flick across uh, but you've got to figure out leading and lagging indicators some of them are more important than others um, these are just examples they might not work for your organization uh, i don't know why there's animation again and it's doing it on all of them uh, but unrealized value, uh, time to market, so even um, cycle time, release frequency, lead time, uh, these are all lagging indicators. Uh, there are, there are uh, leading indicators, frequency of build success might be a leading indicator. Uh, make sure you've got and understand your measures effectively. Um, and innovation rate. Installed version index is a good one. If you have a desktop product, what percentage of your customers are on the latest version of your product? Um, I think that's a good indication um, of how versatile uh, your organization or your product is at getting, getting out. Because people aren't taking new versions, there's probably something wrong. It's probably technical debt. It's probably hard to install, hard to support, hard, hard to bring people out up to speed. All kinds of things like that. Um, so those are just example uh, metrics, uh, if you're going to collect some metrics, just get started. Don't worry about uh, getting too detailed. Collect some metrics, uh, monitor the data, and see if you're improving things or not within your organization. Um, I use some of the metrics here with customers I work with, um, and we monitor uh, uh, that data to make sure that when we make changes, they're actually adding value. And it's okay to make changes and they don't add value. We'll just stop that change. We'll stop doing that thing. But we need to know that it's making a difference. And the only way you can do that is with concrete measures. Um, and this term, EBM uh, metrics, evidence-based management, uh, EBM, um, is something that, that actually comes out of the medical profession. Um, about 100 years ago, or actually 120-ish years ago, uh, the medical profession decided that it would be a good idea to make decisions on your health uh, based on you know data like your blood pressure and uh, uh, you know collecting some data and figuring out how to solve your problem rather than just making up an idea and hoping it works so this evidence-based management is for managers uh, and organizational leaders to look at actual data make changes see how those changes impact the data are we taking the organization uh, in the right direction like pro project cost per iteration, time to market, innovation rate, how much time do we spend innovating versus struggling with complexity, uh, satisfaction of our customers and employees, is that trending up or is it trending down? Uh, product revenue and costs, these are all things that are important measures of organizational and product performance. Um, and we want to be optimizing those things. We want to making those numbers look a little bit better um, and we can tell whether we're making uh, 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 headway if we have balance across all of those things. That's why I had four different categories of metrics because we could have aw awesome uh, uh, time to market, but we're delivering a bunch of crap to our customers. So we need to make sure um, that we balance all of that out. Uh, let's see. Yep. Just keep things uh, uh, simple. Um, while my diagram might look super complicated now, uh, you saw it's literally just it's just Scrum, um, a way to scale Scrum very simply, and then a way to to measure it, uh, and that's really the idea. The SDK in there is just um, let's share some data. So it's probably a community of practice 
across all of our teams to help share some of those good ideas um, maybe create um, a starter pack for any new team starting up where should they start within the context of this organization so every company will build something different um, frameworks are just a starting point um, and it's okay for them to start with Kanban, start with Scrum, start with um, whatever whatever makes sense for them. Uh, I had just some final suggestions. Where is it there? Yep. Um, make sure you measure um, and focus on value and outcomes rather than output and progress. Um, we can output a lot of crap uh, and not get to the outcomes that our organization uh, needs to get to. Um, celebrate success, improve the results, get create a holistic view of what you're doing um, and try and improve those measures, come up with a hypothesis, measures, move, figure out if you're doing the right thing uh, to maximize uh, that learning and really just do the best you can. Um, I think Scott had a, a, a good comment is sometimes you'll try something and you'll just be wrong and that's okay. Um, we need to do the best we can with the information we have uh, and see where we get to. That was kind of what I wanted to cover. Um, so just to say I covered um, a bunch of stuff around uh, Scrum Engineering Excellence with the Kanban Guide. Nexus Framework, so don't scale <laughs> pretty much is my advice. Um, really avoid it at all costs if you can. Um, and then evidence-based management, actually make sure you look at, at data. Um, you can get a copy of the slides from that link at the bottom. Um, that's already been published for you. Um, and I guess we move over to questions. Yeah, we'll take we'll take questions, but we've got a bit of time. Um, Was I talking too fast? haven't had any come through. <laughs> No, no, no. We don't um, let any come chat. So, yeah. Um, if there are questions, yeah, we've got time to take some. Yeah. No, I think that was, was great. Yeah, thanks for that, Martin. It was really good. Um, really enjoyed it. Um, it's a really good insight and stuff. There. Um, I think just on the Nexus stuff, because as you know, I've kind of been delving into the yep. Scrum at Scale stuff lately. Yes. Uh, well, for the beginning of the year and kind of quite enjoying the same sort of ideas as Nexus where, you know, you want a really good kind of well-oiled, well sort of functioning scrum team that's doing it really well and then you're kind yeah. of scaling it out. Can and I take the view that scrum at scale kind of is similar to Nexus in that, you know, it doesn't really add much more than just, you've just got lots of scrum teams and then you've got some additional teams that are just supporting you as, as you scale up. So you're scrum with scrums and then some of the governance teams, but Nexus does seem sort of even more simpler than that. Um, do you see any any challenges? Have you ever sort of implemented Nexus somewhere? Do you, do you see what coming in, in, in Nexus as a framework? Is there anything you think Nexus lacks? So, yeah, there are tons of things that Nexus lacks. It's supposed to lack them. Um, mm. It's it, it is just a framework, just like uh, uh, Scrum lacks what is your definition of done Yeah, if you yeah. don't have a good definition of done your Scrum's not going to be very good um, if you, you don't know where your backlog comes from and how to get that and create a backlog Scrum doesn't tell you how to do that and, and Nexus is the same it's, it's trying to be um, it's trying not to be prescriptive on your business practices because the, the, the reality is that the way, sorry, I've said that quite a lot, the reality is, um, I'll try and stop doing that. Um, every organization is unique. The success or failure of an organization is in that uniqueness. So the idea that, and I know I'm, I was pooping on safe a lot, but the idea that you can have every organization use the same blueprint and be just as successful is is why uh, uh, Nexus and Scrum at Scale and Scrum are very compact and the minimum to to solve the the empirical 
problem. You want to create an empirical process mm -hmm. control system so you can expect and adapt to the best possible outcome, or at least sure. the, the most relevant outcome. Um, that idea, and I think Ken and Jeff almost totally agree between uh, Nexus and Scrum at Scale. Um, there's just there's some differences in the terminology, but definitely there's yeah. a little bit more in Scrum at Scale that Ken just didn't want to be prescriptive about. Um, and I think mm. that's that's okay. I think there's room for all of the frameworks. And I would yeah. say if, if you're using Scrum at Scale, um, you're going to have exactly the same outcomes as you might have if you use Nexus, as long as you see it as a starting point and a foundation and not, here's what we're going to do. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, no, I think, I think so. I think so. I think, uh, as you say, the best frameworks are probably ones that, well, it's exactly in the definition of a framework, right? Yeah. It kind of gives some shape, but it doesn't try to be too prescriptive and it shouldn't be because then it's going to, yeah, it's dictating too much to you and it's going to be restrictive, right, and constrain you and it, every, as you say, every organisation is unique, so you need to have that room to manoeuvre to tailor it to your own needs and, and that, that, that's a good thing. Yeah. Is, did any questions come in? I've got a couple of good, good ones here. So let's just, just, just I like good them. ones. So, so Mark, yeah, I like this first one. So, so Mark Martin's asking, because I often have this conversation myself, so Martin's interested in sort of product owner opinions. So if we pull them from the, oh, it's just jumped. Some other ones have come in once. Um, if we pull them from the business, so, you know, a PO gets appointed, you know, into the role um, and they tend to be a kind of mixed bag. Is there any ways or, or, or any good ways of kind of helping get them into shape in your experience? Because, you know, we've all worked with different types of POs, right? They come in different yeah. flavors. What are your thoughts on helping a PO get to the place you might want them to, so that they're effective? Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm is a question. I'm definitely. I'm definitely going to punt the professional scrum product owner. Um. So you know, I don't teach that one. Uh. So I'm punting mm. somebody else's uh, thing. But I. I think that that many uh, uh, product owners, when when they first start, and even if they've been a product owner for quite a long time. They have a very narrow view of what a product owner's job is. Very narrow. And yeah. if you think about a product owner as being fully fiscally accountable mm. for what they choose to spend money on, then that idea of accountability inside of Scrum, which comes with that product owner role, accountability for uh, uh, value, is is um is key to that so if they don't understand that accountability or they don't enact that accountability so they need to be looking at the market market trends they need to be looking at um, how users are actually using the product and um, a lot of or quite a lot of ux comes under the product owner world because that's how uh, users interact with their uh, ideas these are all business problems to go solve um, the technical part actually it t tends to not be the biggest problem. It's mm -hmm. uh, getting those product owners up to speed. Um, I do have a, a, a company I worked with in Australia, a, a consulting company, um, and they, they themselves would pay for the potential product owners from their customers to go on the professional Scrum product owner class so that they knew what was expected of them. And they found that that, I guess it was 2000 Australian dollars, that $2,000 investment made a massive difference to the success or failure of their projects uh, with those customers because they really understood uh, uh, the scope of that product product owner role and the ability that comes with it. And I'll tell you something, Seth, that I, I've been through the product owner class um, and I, figured out that I wouldn't ever want to be a product owner. Yeah, and no, I've done it. I've done the, yeah. the PSPO, and I think you're right. I think if you're really doing it, there's a lot for one person to be accountable for and just, you know, the, the different dimensions to the role. Yeah. You know, that that, that there are so alongside the It's not any different from a CEO. And the budgetary piece. And in you're, some ways, yeah, and, and yeah. a bit like the, well, you know, we talked about the, the Nexus sort of 
Scrum at scale of the product. Yeah, exactly. So the Scrum at scale, you know, if you're a chief product owner, you might likely actually be the chief exec and you're playing that role. Um, some organizations, it's like that. So yeah, it's... uh, I would say to Martin, just as a a final product owner thing, is uh, uh, your product owner is the one that's accountable to the business for value delivery, not the development team. So if your development team are have good engineering practices and are delivering high quality working increments every iteration but they're building the wrong thing the buck should stop at the product owner not at the development team because they don't decide what they go work on having some of those ideas ingrained into that role and um, will help if people feel that they're they're responsible for spending money they'll up their game that's a good one. Yeah, that's no, really good. Um, that's an excellent point. Got another one for you here. Um, quickly, I think we'll still. Yeah, we'll still got still got some time. So Craig, Craig's. Um, I guess it's coming back to what you were sort of talking about earlier about when we talked about frameworks and how prescriptive they are. Uh, so if we avoid being prescriptive, do we risk never being able to set a direction of travel? I.e., doing Scrum badly is the accepted norm. So that's, yeah. that's a question. I get. I get. Um, so I, I think that, I think that's an interesting point. So the the question is, um, if we're being less prescriptive, are we in danger of of doing doing scrum badly? As as just accepting yep. that. Yeah. Um, yep. I I would say no, because um, what what are what are the transparencies in scrum? You've got three transparencies in Scrum, okay? You've got transparency of the future in the product backlog. Do we know where we're going and how we might start to get there? That's the product owner's accountability. So if you don't have an ordered backlog, if everybody in the organization that needs to doesn't understand what's in that backlog and why it's there, you've got a problem. You're not doing Scrum, yeah? That role of product owner is not doing its job. Um, you've got the, the, the sprint backlog, which provides uh, transparency for the present, what you're doing now. That has its own things, but we'll talk about that just now. Um, and then you've got transparency of the past, which is the usable increment. So in, the, in software terms, you need to have working software that can be deployed to production at the end of every iteration, including the first iteration. Does your team have that? If not, they're doing Scrum badly. They're doing Agile badly. Yeah. You need to get that minimum bar. I, I, I And I think it's often overlooked. The minimum bar for Scrum is, is a usable increment. You have to have working software at the end of your sprint. Otherwise, that wasn't a sprint because then you have no transparency. You can't inspect and adapt. You don't have an empirical process control system. I, I think in, in this group, we can have this conversation, but when you're yeah. talking with customers, you have to be a little bit more pragmatic and say, well, okay, you're, you're doing Scrum because you tried really hard to get a working increment, um, but I wouldn't expect a team to be on sprint 30 and still unable to get a usable increment every single sprint. That should be a no-brainer by then. Yeah, and mm-hmm. um, the Azure DevOps yeah. team at Microsoft, which was forty teams working together on one product, took about 15, 15 was it fifteen? Maybe less, but maybe ten, ten to fifteen sprints to get their crap together. But that mm-hmm. was six hundred and fifty people working together on one product. But since then, every sprint. Out of the last uh, 150 odd sprints, eight years of sprinting has been deployed to production. That's pretty impressive. That's yeah. that's like your minimum bar. So 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 Craig, I I I think that's the difference between man- mechanical Scrum and actually doing it. Focus on the the values and principles, building trust, the transparencies, um, and and good scrum will come out of that um but it is difficult it's a long journey and you need to uplift the skills on your team and your product owner 
along the way to get there. Um, I would definitely, uh, Craig, look at the Kanban guide for Scrum teams. That's the um, batch size and flow optimization that you might be looking for to take your not so good looking Scrum to the next level. Is there another question? So, right, we've got another question. Uh, not, not, not did he come through. Uh, so, so I, I've kind of got one. It's, it's less of a question, but I guess you and I would probably oh. have this debate for hours and we don't have hours. But you know this whole idea of kind of starting somewhere, right? And we get it, right? You know, you just make a start. I can't remember who you said, probably Einstein. One of these guys had a, a kind of quote of, of that nature, but still when you start somewhere you do need a relatively good starting point how do you go about trying to at least figure out what might be a good starting point as, yeah. a, as a bad starting point you know you do you do need something how do you, how do you identify that it, it depends what your I, I would say it depends what your focus is i'm a good consultant mm. everything starts with it depends um but <laughs> you, you you're if if i'm in as a scrum master with a scrum team my my focus um, while I've got a side focus of getting good product ownership, that can be a little bit bigger political nut to crack. Um, but getting a high quality engineering team is something you can focus on. Um, and having a good definition of done is, is <clears throat> for me, uh, one of the top starting points. If you can get the team building good software, even if you're building the wrong software, it's no longer the team's problem, if that kind of makes sense. Um, so yeah. one of the exercises I always try and do with teams at the start, even teams that have been working together in Scrum for a while, um, is to um, get everybody together who has to say it's okay to release your software to, to production. So you've got your team, you've got your change dudes, you've got your ops, whatever you've got, get everybody together and get everybody, do a liberating structure, the one, two, four, all liberating structure. Um, and get everybody to write post-its for everything that has to be true to ship your software to production. What needs to be true? Get all of those post-its on a board, dedupe it. That is in effect your definition of done that mirrors usable increment. Yeah, you have to be able to ship it to production for it to be usable, therefore all of those things have to be true. And then draw, mm. have another board with a line on it. Above the line is stuff you can do now. Below the line is stuff you can't do yet. You're, it's just not, it's not possible to do that yet. Organize the stickies. What's yeah. above the line is your current definition of done. What's below the line are opportunities for improvement, impediments for removal. Mm -hmm. Work towards it. Every sprint at your retrospective, be looking at the things that are below the line is there anything that we've done enough engineering work? We've upskilled our processes, our practices, our code enough to move something up to that definition of done and put a pin in it. Yeah. And I think that that's where I would start with most teams, that, that initial definition of done and what are our options for later. Hopefully everything's mm -hmm. above the line. Then you have yeah. a usable increment that you can deploy to production with no further work required from the development team. That's a good shout. Right? That's hard though. Hard? Yes, yeah. yeah. Well, if you get that right, you're, uh, you're If quite, you get that right, I mean, that's an you're, awesome place. Yeah, you do. I was going to say, you're, you're, you're in a fairly good place. Right? Yeah, yeah. You might be building the wrong hey, thing, I don't, I don't... but you're in a fairly good mm -hmm. place. <laughs> wow. Comes back to what you said earlier. You want to add value to the customer, right? Um, we don't have any other questions coming through, so I'm I'm, I'm just conscious of the time, so I'll probably wrap it up in a minute. Um, do you want to say a couple of words about stuff you've got coming up, other oh. courses and things you've got in the pipeline? I know you're going to have to move to virtual, and you've probably got a bit of yeah. work to do on that front. But do you want to just so give we're we're scrambling you guys a bit of an idea? Yeah, we're scrambling around a little bit, trying to figure out how to do this, not just from a you know flip that switch and make it virtual, uh, but how do we mm. actually deliver classes virtually? Um, yeah. So I've, I've got a, a bunch of classes that I had a, a pre-set up for Edinburgh. Um, I think in two weeks I have a, a PSM and a, a, a professional scrum master and a professional scrum with UX class. And um, they'll both be moving to virtual, but they're pretty near. Nobody's signed up for them yet, 
mainly because of all the things that are going on. Um, mm -hmm. So if anybody's interested, please let me know uh, about that. Um, and then Daniel Vacanti, who was one of the original um, Kanban Method founders at Corbis yeah. uh, and who co-founded yep. the LKU uh, with David Anderson, yep. is going to be teaching a professional scrum with Kanban with me. Uh, meant to be an Edinburgh class again, but we'll be doing it online. Um, and I think after that, we have a, a PAL-E, Professional Agile Leadership Essentials, um, which uh, uh, focuses that, that middle management layer in an organization that doesn't work directly with on a Scrum team, but works with Scrum teams. How do they move their game from management towards leadership? That's the idea. So we've got some stuff coming up. You can find it on my website. You can find it on the scrum.org uh, site as well. Uh, my website is nkdagility.com. Um, and if anybody has any uh, uh, questions, martin at nkdagility.com. Also, Mr. Hinch on Twitter and wherever else you can find me. If you Google for me, you'll find tons of stuff. <laughs> Excellent. Brilliant. Thanks, Martin. That's great. Um, right, I'll just start. So just a couple of community announcements. Um, got a couple of, well, there's going to be hopefully these type of events. So next week, Thursday the 26th, our friends at the Heart of Agile um, meet up. I've got an amazing event, actually. They've got a nice sort of Q&A virtual event where they're going to be hosting Jeff Watts. I'm sure many of you have. <laughs> I have his books in the house, so that's going to be that's going to be awesome. I'm I'm, I'm signed up for that one. I think that looks like it's going to be really good. It's really full, good attendees. I'm on the waiting yeah, list. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Are you? No, I'm, I'm I'm on the I, I was in there fast. So uh, yeah, I think it's about eighty folks signed up for it. So that's going to be brilliant. Um, and then our next event is in May. Now, wait for that. That's the twenty seventh. That will be the right to left. If any of you have, have, have read that, so that's. Um, by our friend Mike Burrow, so he's going to be doing a, a remote event to talk about some of the key ideas in that. So that's one for your diary if you're interested in that. You'll find all these on Meetup. So um, yeah, sign up before they fill up. Um, and I think that's it, really. Um, if there's any others, yeah, we can post them out onto the our LinkedIn group. If anybody's interested in joining that, you know, keep sharing, keep talking. Obviously, we're socially distancing, but we, you know, it's. Let's not be distant, keep the conversations going, and uh, thanks for joining us this evening, and uh, yeah, stay safe. Look after yourselves and your loved ones. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, guys. Great. Thanks, everyone. Yeah. Hello. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I'll just a wee thank you to BCS as well.